Hello, and welcome to the Zicklin Talks Business Series. I am Paquita Davis Friday, Interim Dean of the Zicklin School of Business, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar titled, A Strong Economy and Weak Labor Unions, Why? Joining me is Gwen Webb, Associate Dean for Executive Programs, who will moderate the question and answer period. Our guests today are Dr. Stephanie Luce, Professor of Labor Studies, CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies, and Professor of Sociology at the CUNY, CUNY Graduate Center, and Aaron Brenner, Senior Capital Markets Analyst at the United Food and Commercial Workers International Union. Leading the conversation is Larry Zicklin, retired chairman of Noberger Berman, an alumnus, our benefactor, and an instructor in our programs. Larry, you take it from here. Thank you very much, Paquita. Uh, first, let me make some disclosure. The disclosure is that Aaron is my nephew. So now we're all on the same uh, level. I want to start by seeing if we can agree on one thing. And that is that over the last 60 years, the labor movement in the United States has not been successful. Is that a fair statement? Well, I would say that actually it has been successful. It's won tremendous gains for workers overall, raising the minimum wage, raising the standard of living, really changing the conditions of employment to a more stable living wage um, economy. Um, that has been greatly eroded in the last several decades, but I would say overall still the impact is pretty significant, even including things like labor union impact on, on having a 40-hour work week, having a weekend, um, having the notion of even influence on public schools and public goods. So I would say the overall balance sheet is still positive, but their power has definitely eroded. Well, my recollection is when I was at Baruch, for example, in the 50s, the uh, share of workers that were unionized was something like 30% or a third, a number like that. And to my uh, understanding is that today it's about 10%. Doesn't that make the movement unsuccessful? Successful for the workers, but unsuccessful in terms of the numbers that they represent? Aaron, would, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's fair to say that the, the density of unions has dropped. I think they still, as Stephanie pointed out, they still punch above their weight in the sense that even though they have, uh, they don't represent uh, as a large a portion of the workforce, they still have a outsized influence on public policy and on the industries in which they represent workers. They're able to drive better uh, wages and working conditions and benefits. So it's true they're not as powerful as they used to be. Uh, there's no, I would, I can't disagree with that. But isn't that outside influence liable to wane when only six percent of uh, workers, outside public uh, sector workers, are unionized? Um, can't I infer from that that the power of unions will wane over over a period of time, unless yeah, something think... changes? Right. I think that's the question is, will something change? I think we're really in a make or break moment. I think we're at a point where we're going to find that this model is unsustainable and workers are, in fact, fighting back and pushing for dramatic changes. Um, things like improving the labor law, improving regulations uh, in their industries and fighting for um, more opportunities to unionize. Um, so I think we're seeing the beginnings of a wave of workers pushing back and trying to reverse that trend. It could go the other way. As you say, it could continue to decline because, in fact, the forces are really stacked against workers. Um, our labor law in the United States is quite weak. Uh, it's it's weak to begin with, and then it's not enforced very well, uh, you know, or that can vary, certainly under different political administrations. Um, and so... The, the labor law is against them and also the their rights and regulations is uh you know the their employers have a lot of power and um are extremely uh well resourced they can just break the laws and ignore the laws and not play by the rules and with very little penalty so it may continue you're right it may continue that the unions are going to lose more and more power but this these few years is going to really be the the key moment that tells us which direction it goes and, and I want to get to that, but be, before I get there, um, 
half of the labor uh, movement, half of the union movement is in uh, seven states, something like that. New York, California, Pennsylvania, Washington, New Jersey, Ohio. Can you have that concentration with the other states really not having much of a labor movement and still succeed? It's not easy. Uh, I think you're right. I think it's it definitely, um, but this is, I think you're seeing this not just in the field of uh, labor and collective bargaining, you're seeing this in a lot of other areas in where rights are being eroded in different states. So I think that's part of a, a larger political process uh, that's taking place and unions are part of that um, of that process. So I, but again, I would also point out that it varies by industry. So that in our industry, uh, we're able to have uh, a little higher density in so-called red states. Um, and so, for example, in Texas, uh, a large, we have tens of thousands of grocery workers in Dallas and Houston, places like that. So it, it, it does, there is some uh, variation to that story, but overall, I think you're right that, that um, the geographical concentration is a weakness. So, Stephanie, you made the case that union membership is beneficial to workers. If, if union membership is so beneficial to workers, why is labor organizing doing so poorly? Yeah, there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, you know, we saw a dramatic growth in labor unions uh, membership starting in the 1930s and going through the 1950s. At that point, um, and even in the late in the 40s, uh, employer organizations began to pressure uh, the government to amend the labor law to weaken it, to make it much more difficult for workers to form unions. And then they also began to uh, build a, particularly in those 1970s during the economic crisis, build a reliance on what we call the union avoidance or union busting industry, um, lawyers and consultants um, that would come into a, a unionized company and help them either break the union or, or, to, or to prevent a union coming in at all in the first place. So they've developed a very sophisticated set of tactics, um, both threats, uh, promises, um, you know, uh, a range of tools, and I'm sure Aaron can go into more detail about how this works, um, that really scares workers into uh, unionizing. And then, of course, the ability of businesses to move um, across state lines and across uh, national uh, borders has increased what we call the threat effect. So workers would really be afraid to lose their job. Um, they would try and form a union, they'd be fired, or if they had a union, they they might be threatened with the jobs moving overseas. So and, the is, is there evidence that companies that have been unionized have actually moved overseas as a countermeasure to that uh, union vote? Yes, Aaron would- actually happens. Yeah. Oh, oh, sure. I mean, uh, well, for example, um, garment production, for example, moved from the Northeast to the Southeast to avoid unionization, and then from the Southeast moved to Asia. So that's one example of an industry that's been wholly transformed by globalization. Yeah. And was that strictly due to the union movement and labor costs? Almost entirely. I would think I think if you if you think about it, the the driving force in moving uh, the production of apparel from the United States to Asia was lower wages. Um, because the inputs, other inputs were largely the same, um, but it was the labor costs that were so much different. And so being able first to avoid unions and then being able to avoid uh, other regulations by moving to, to Asia. So- but, did, but didn't those states, uh, let me change the question. Did all of those states have labor movement? Did they all belong to unions before they moved? Uh, in the Northeast? Northeast, yes, but in yes. the Southeast. No, and I think that's why they moved there. 
in fact, and there was there was in the 1970s, for example, there was a huge campaign at a company called J.P. Stevens that I finally did well. that did win. Um, but it was a massive campaign in South Carolina to organize uh, about 10 or 11 uh, clothing mills. And uh, but in the end, uh, over time, they eventually shut down and moved abroad. Because you think of those states as non-union states, right to work states. Uh, That's correct. They, the folks, those companies still moved to Asia. Yeah, I know friends of mine. Despite the, the transportation costs, so that that's how much cheaper the labor was there, and of course it moved first to to Taiwan and then to China, now to Bangladesh, and right, so it keeps moving to lower and lower wage places. I guess that's an easy industry to move from one place to another. Yes. Uh, other, I mean, other industries. You, you made steel; it wouldn't be so easy to move your manufacturing of a steel plant. Yeah, you'd be surprised. I think really? that was. Oh yeah, sure. So I think even in the steel industry, this took place uh, as well. So uh, you have mini mills developed uh, in the 80s and 90s in China, and uh, you know they were partly subsidized by the Chinese government. So that allowed them to uh, undercut U.S. production. And so, I'm, assu I'm assuming new mills are more efficient than old mills. Correct. Right. Yeah, and some of the transition happens when a, a, a firm, a manufacturing firm is becoming outdated in the United States rather than uh, renew it and reinvest, new investment moves overseas. So new plants and new investment starts That's overseas. Right. In, it's not necessarily picking up one whole plant and moving it in all these cases. And you absorb the shipping cost and it's still worth it. Mm -hmm. Because the shipping cost of steel is not like the shipping cost of garments. Right, right. And that's why there's been some discussion, particularly in the, during the pandemic, about whether some of these jobs right. and industries would start coming back to the United States. We've seen a little bit of that, but really not yet quite the, the, the movement that some people predicted. I'm, I'm now going back to an, um, an academic question, if I might. Would either or both of you argue that a stronger lab labor movement is good for the country? And how would you make that argument? Sure. Uh, well, I, I could start and Aaron could and add in, I'm sure. Um, I think that the research is, is starting to show pretty clearly that countries with higher levels of collective bargaining um, are have stronger economic growth, are slower to go into a recession and quicker to come out of a recession, um, have lower inequality overall, which is good for a whole number of indicators from health outcomes um, to educational access and so forth, um, and that they reduce discrimination uh, and reduce other kinds of harmful impacts such as unfair firing and so forth uh, for not just for unionized workers, but there's some evidence to suggest that there is some spillover effect depending on the level of unionization. Wait, wait, wait a second. How does, how does a union reduce discrimination? Well, because now there's rules and regulations that there's a clear contract about who gets hired, who gets promoted, um, who gets fired. You have a process, you know, in any kind of a, a company. My very first job, I was a softball umpire and I found out I was paid less than all the boys. I was the only girl, but I had no recourse. You know, I just had to complain about it and they told me to be quiet. So, but if I had a union contract, it would lay out what my wages were. There would be a clear um, mechanism for me to file a grievance um, and get some, you know, fair hearing. Um, and so the employers can't um, play favoritism in the way that they would without those kinds of safeguards. Stephanie, don't I, don't I remember that the union movement at one time, I'm sure it's not true now, was rife with nepotism. You can only get a union job if your uncle or your father or your mother had a union job. Otherwise, you couldn't get into that union or you couldn't be trained. Is that unfair? Um, there certainly were unions where that was dominant, particularly in certain um, occupations and parts of the country. But I, I'm not sure to say the union movement overall, it's such a large movement. There were certain unions that actually 
formed in response to that, to say like, oh, we're actually, you know, organizing to counter the nepotism and to make jobs more accessible for everyone. So we've seen uh, both ends of that spectrum for sure. Yeah, I would just add that the, the union, if you look at the wages of unionized women and unionized people of color, they're far um, better than their, their non-union peers. And the gap between men and women and white workers and workers of color um, is much smaller when they're unionized. So unionization definitely uh, reduces the uh, gender and racial pay gaps. Um, so, and in terms of the, um, the racism and sexism of certain unions, uh, I think they're, they could not have done that without the employer's participation. So the employers in certain industries took advantage of that, uh, those racial and sex and gender divisions to weaken the union. Because a union where there is a threat of other workers coming in, that undermines the capacity of the union to um, uh, collectively improve wages and working conditions. So um, it wasn't, I, I'm not defending the unions here for their racism or sexism, but I'm trying to point out that it wasn't as if the employers were saying, oh, you know, we have to hire more women, we have to hire African Americans, um, and it's just the unions preventing us to do this. So oftentimes there was um, employer participation. Well, I'm not implying that the employees weren't, uh, employers weren't as racist or sexist as anybody else, for right. sure. Right. Um, can you point to other countries where the union movement is more powerful and demonstrate to our audience why their societies are better off, as you state, than uh, when unions are less powerful, such as the United States? Sure. Well, the unions are strongest in the Nordic countries. Um, and, uh, you know, so when we look at parts of Europe, Germany, um, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, um, the unions are still quite strong there. They're also even strong in countries like France uh, that actually have a lower union membership than the United States, but the unions have the ability to negotiate sectoral uh, agreements that set wages and working conditions for an industry as a whole. So uh, what we see in those countries is, you know, lower rates of inequality, uh, higher uh, rates of, um, well, almost incomplete access to things like health insurance, very you know, strong um, benefits, paid maternity leave or parental leave, I should say, um, much longer vacation days. And so many of these benefits go society-wide. They're, they're, they cover the union workers, but they also cover non-union workers as well. So the uh, work week, uh, the expectation of uh, work intensity and all that is much improved. In fact, you know, many people are sometimes shocked uh, to find out um, that Americans have so little um, access to things like paid sick leave, for example. Um, in most parts of the country, you can't even get paid if you're, you know, if you have COVID and you can't come to work. And that's, uh, we don't, you know, in, in countries with strong labor movements, we see um, and we also see stronger investment in the public good overall in those countries. Um, the public education systems, public parks, libraries, and so forth um, tend to go. And that's not always a causal relationship, but there tends to be a strong correlation between higher unionization and those outcomes. And, and is that something you negotiate uh, very strongly for in your union, Aaron, for all these sides, other than wages for a second? Well, in the United States, Yes, we have to fight incredibly hard for um, things like retirement and health care, which in other countries often is uh, universal, universally provided. Um, so uh, health care obviously is one of the most important benefits that we negotiate. And 
it has a huge impact in the sense that because we have a system in which employers uh, are, um, in which workers are uh, deferring some of their wages into either retirement or into healthcare, uh, we have uh, th we have lower wages because of that. The wages are lower uh, because those because employers uh, and workers together have to pay for that. Um, whereas in other countries, that's paid out of taxes. Um, and of course, in places like France, the tax rate is higher. Correct. That's right. That's right. So um, we all pay. That's true, one way or the other. But in those other places, you have universal coverage, which you don't have um, in the United States. So, so I guess Stephanie might know that the, the um, I think it's about 50% of the workforce is covered by uh, health uh, employer health insurance, something around that. Um, so uh, as the union, this is something that we um, fight very, very uh, hard for and defend once we win it. And it's something that's, um, uh, and we've gotten much better, we've gotten quite good at, for example, um, pooling our workforce so that we can lower healthcare costs by spreading those healthcare costs across a larger population and often uh, adding young workers in with older workers so that um, we can reduce the cost of healthcare uh, for the union and the employers combined. So it's something we focus uh, a lot on. Are the demographics of the union movement such that older workers represent um, a larger share than their uh, participation in the population would indicate? And therefore healthcare costs are much heavier for union uh, workers? Yes, the union population is aging in part because a union job is a good job. People will stick in those jobs. They don't uh, tend to have the high turnover that we see in non-union workplaces, and they have some protections too. So, um, so the the union membership has been aging, and you're right that it is. Uh, has an impact on healthcare costs, as well as retirees. And so if you think about something like uh, an auto manufacturer, GM, GM's paying health insurance for their workforce, as well as their retirees. And they're trying to compete with Toyota or Volvo or so forth, where healthcare is provided uh, in, a, in a public system. So it's when we say it's good for the economy, we're also saying, you know, it can help employers be more competitive if they're not covering these huge healthcare costs for their older members and retirees. It's one of the reasons the auto oh, industry, sorry. it's one of the reasons the auto industry moved to Mississippi and Louisiana and Alabama and South Carolina um, is to avoid those costs. Well, I didn't I remember, don't I remember once reading that there was mo more health care costs per car than there was steel? It's certainly possible. <laughs> Well, so let me let me just move on to on this point. In the United States, most public companies are incorporated in the state of Delaware for all kinds of reasons. And Delaware law says that managements of public companies have an obligation to the corporation, the long term interests of the corporation, obviously, and the shareholders. And this seems to involve operating at the lowest possible costs. How do you reconcile that uh, with the needs of labor, which obviously raise costs, or do they? Yeah, so that's a, that is a, that's a real problem. Like that's the rules and regulations that set up the game. And if that's the rules, then you can see why corporations would do that. It doesn't have to be the rule. And uh, we have other, you know, B corporations, I guess they're, you know, and other countries set up different rules. It's the same thing with cities and counties that might have legislation saying you have to accept the low cost bidder on any contract. Like that's the rule, no matter the quality, no matter the long-term longevity of the service or whatever it might be. If the rules say you have to accept low cost bidder, that's the rules, but you can try and change the rules. And that's one way to go with this is to say that, okay, you also have other obligations other than the highest returns to your shareholder. You might have obligations to, um, 
you know, your workers, your the community, the consumers, uh, you know, there are all other kinds of uh, constituencies to consider. Now, I, I would add too that it, it's often not clear what's in the shareholder's interest. Not all shareholders have the same interest. Somehow it's assumed that shareholders are a, a uniform a group of people who all have the same exact interests. And it, I don't think that's quite fair. Certainly a pension fund, which has obligations over decades, needs long-term returns to meet those obligations, whereas uh, a hedge fund or an individual investor has a much shorter time horizon and therefore has a different set of interests. And so there's some competition, in fact, among shareholders about what um, a direction a company should take. And unfortunately, I would argue over the last um, decades, we have seen a move towards more short-term time horizons, um, more rapid um, turnover of assets, uh, which has real uh, impact on the other stakeholders in a company. But, but even whether it's short-term or long-term, Aaron, the overriding interest of shareholders is rates of return. I, I would love to make a 12% rate of return for the next 20 years on my investments. Um, yeah, but your PE firm would not. A, pri a private equity firm would not. No, that's they not would enough for that. Higher rate of return. That's right. Over yeah, a shorter but, time, over a shorter time period. But, and they now own corporations that represents, I think, something in the neighborhood of 50 or 60 million workers. Maybe not quite that high. Maybe it's closer to 40. But tens of millions of workers now toil for corporations owned under that model. Yeah, but the implication of what you're saying is that in the short run, unionization may impede rates of return, but in the long run, it, uh, um, it improves rates of return. What's the evidence for that? I don't see any evidence for that. Well, there is some evidence. I mean, I, I, I'll, I'm, I will, we've put together, and I can certainly share it with you, we've put together a bibliography of studies that have looked at the impact of unionization and it's mixed, there's no question, and it depends by industry, but there certainly is evidence in some cases where um, the uh, once companies are unionized, the turnover is reduced, so those costs are eliminated. Uh, their tenure is increased, so productivity can increase often. Um, given the fact that you might have higher wages, uh, there's an incentive for management to find savings in other areas. So becoming, uh, investing more in other techniques to reduce uh, costs and to improve output. So there's, uh, it's not clear that uh, unions represent uh, a burden on a, on a company. Plus you have, and I think this is something, you know, famously, uh, made uh, you know made famous by Henry Ford, uh, he paid a wage that uh, he wanted so that his workers um, could buy his cars, and this was quite radical at the time. And and there were a lot of rich people who were very upset about this because it meant that the car was no longer this very uh, elite and privileged thing uh, that only they had access to. But now all the hoi polloi uh, could drive. Yeah, but there, there, there was one difference, I think, and that is that Henry Ford had almost a monopoly uh, on motor cars. I mean, he was the leading producer of motor cars. Well, not not by the thir not by the thirties. By the thirties, it was General Motors was much was bigger. But the but the point is that either way, the the, the and General Motors had to match his wages eventually. So my, the point all I'm trying to make is is that there's a there's a demand side to this. Uh, to the economy that unions contribute to. And so if you have, it, uh, yeah. But it's more than wages. One of the criticisms you get of unions is their extreme rigidity in work rules. 
Companies just say it's impossible to deal with the unions. Every little thing I do, I have to ch ch uh, check with some union head to see if I can get this piece of paper picked up or somebody to do this job. And it, it changes my way of doing business. What would be your response to that charge? Well, yeah, I, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, it is true that I, I sometimes I, I think that some of the evidence suggests that the companies are moving to avoid the union, not necessarily because of the wages, but for this reason, which is being able to control entirely um, all parts of the process from hiring and firing to um, the work, the labor process. So it's certainly that's the case that what unions do is to set up um, mechanisms to have some worker voice and input into that process. Um, there are, uh, you know, what's interesting is I think there's a part of this is also U.S. culture is a very legal culture. There's a lot of rules and regulations in every part of our society, whether it's a union contract or not. Um, and so that's a lot of is about uh, dealing with lawyers. Um, so, you know, you could have a unionized setting that has more flexibility or less flexibility. Um, but certainly that is one of the things that employers have said. They just don't want any of that regulation. Um, it's a it's a struggle. But I think that, you know, there's some of the research does suggest that those companies, even if they don't want it, they may perform the work better. Workers know the labor process. They know how to get the work done. Um, they have the skill set. They have the knowledge. Um, so bringing them into the process is actually often better in the long term for the company anyways. And is there we, we were speaking we were speaking to the uh, uh, head of human resources at uh, Danone, a, a French company, which is, um, and he argued that one of the reasons they support unionization and don't interfere when their workers try to unionize is that the union holds management accountable and forces their managers to be much more creative, much more interactive, um, and much more uh, productive. So they see it as not necessarily a cost because they're willing to engage in that dialogue. And I would just point out, workers and unions have no interest in hurting the profitability of a company and destroying a company's uh, ability to survive. That's not in their interest. So it's um, so that the, this idea that, you know, and it, this is certainly the case in our industry. If you look at our industry, the idea that um, uh, our grocers or companies like Tyson are not profitable because of work rules, um, I just think is not, doesn't, the evidence doesn't support that. So let me just pursue that one more second. If it's in the interest of management and it's their legal responsibility, their fiduciary responsibility to secure the highest rates of return for companies, Delaware law, and unions and unionization aids in that process, why are most managements so uh, hostile to the unions? Well, I, I, again, I think that you're right about the short termism, like from day to day, no one, uh, none of these managers want to have to be challenged and they want the highest return. Um, there are a lot of things that are good for us in the long term that we don't want to do. I don't want to go to the gym, but I, I know that I should do it. Um, and so there is an element of that, which is like, we're going to resist the thing, resist and we're going to take the least um, you know, the, the, the easiest option if we can. And it's generally setting up mechanisms and accountability that would uh, force us to take a healthier direction. I mean, Larry, you, you work, you know, you went to business school, you are uh, uh, a donor to a business school, you know business schools very well. Um, do business schools teach managers how to deal with unions? Do they teach managers how to collectively bargain? Generally, no. Generally, the assumption is that managers are uh, complete rulers of their companies and that there's not any uh, democracy. There's no input. This is a hierarchy in which managers have control. And in fact, the best managers exercise that control um, in the most effective ways. And so there's no one 
so that so and the culture which we have our business culture celebrates uh, rock star CEOs who are able to uh, you know create and deliver uh, you know all these returns. So there's very little culture uh, within business that supports the idea that collective bargaining could be good for a company. And in fact, most of it is hostile. So I think that's another reason why uh, a lot of companies resist unions. You both earlier mentioned um, the US government. Has the government failed the labor movement? And if so, how? Well, I would say that uh, in the sense of letting, um, allowing the labor law to be weakened dramatically over the decades and then failing to enforce it fairly, um, there are a lot of things that need to be improved in labor law to give workers a fair chance. Um, and that has just not happened. There's been round after round after round of attempts to revise labor law. So that's one way in which I think is a problem. The other problem is, is a bit more general is just the lack of investment in um, public sector jobs. Like a lot of public sector institutions have been greatly eroded and that has hurt uh, you know, workers, whether, you know, unionized workers uh, as well, it's workers in general, and as well as the public, because, you know, if we let our public schools deteriorate and fall apart, if our libraries shut down and so forth, um, that hurts unions, but it would, it hurts everyone. You seem to be just agreeing, Aaron, if I can just read. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I, there's not, there's, I mean, the, the hostility of, sort of the, the role of the government in labor relations and in the uh, sort of history of unions, I, I think um, has not been a stellar one. Um, clearly, we have a party, one of the political parties that we have has for at least, you know, since 1980 has been uh, outright hostile uh, to unions, um, and uh, we have another party that, even when in power, has failed to deliver labor law reform. So I think the the government has not helped uh, as much as it could, and as much as it did uh, in another period of our history. Does Aaron just directing this to you? Does that indicate that the labor movement? hasn't been able to persuade government that in the long run, a powerful labor movement is an enhancement to life in the United States? Yes, no question, we failed in that, in that regard. The number of people who uh, sort of understand what a union can bring, who, who get to experience a union um, is very small and that has, uh, you know, vast political repercussions. And so you're right that the, this, even though we punch above our weight and certainly, and ge are geographically limited, um, that is a weakness. We've not been able to, and that's been a, look, there's, a, I think this has been a, a campaign, a very conscious campaign on the part of um, employer organizations, really since the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s. Uh, employer organizations have consciously um, uh, organized against unions and to weaken labor law. They've brought various cases um, in the courts. They've brought various cases uh, before the NLRB. They've pursued uh, labor law um, changes. Uh, so this has been a, a very conscious um, campaign that has undermined unions and unions have not been able to fight back. Has government impeded the ability uh, of, union, of unions to attract workers? Is, is there anything in government legislation that has made it more difficult for unions to recruit new workers? Well, just the labor law itself, the general, the National Labor Relations Act um, that governs private sector workers, as well as um, we have uh, 
labor laws for public sector workers that go state by state. Some states do not have that and don't even um, give public sector workers the same rights that of uh, freedom of association, the right to collective bargaining. Um, but the public sector, I mean, the private sector labor law, National Labor Relations Act, um, definitely hinders workers. It gives employers all kinds of rights in um, keeping unions out or scaring workers. Um, the penalties are almost zero for violating the laws. So in that sense, yes, it's uh, it's a very weak law. Yeah, the rights the rights of American workers are are much weaker than uh, other countries. Uh, in Europe, Japan, um, even in parts of Latin America, uh, those countries, Canada, Australia, those workers enjoy much greater rights than those in the United States. I'm happy to give examples too, if you, if you want. And But yet, Aaron, the American economy has worked very well in terms of returns and growth. The economy grows very rapidly. We have more jobs now than ever, I just saw. Uh, the latest month, um, millions of jobs have been added in the last couple of years. How do you equate that success to what you're saying about other countries? We grow faster than most other countries, industrialized countries. We grow faster, but our wages don't. Ah, I mean, the, the, I agree. The, the standard of living in the United States has largely been flat since the early 1970s. I mean, yeah, if you look at I so, point out in the last 40 years, worker wages have not improved almost at all. Correct. So the growth, all of the benefits of the growth that you're talking about, this is what we're saying, is that all of those benefits of that growth has gone to the wealthy. And that is not an economy that we think is one we should be, uh, you know, complimenting and celebrating. And I think in other countries, to the extent that they've been able to avoid the US model, um, have been able to grow, perhaps not as quickly, uh, but more equitably. And they've seen their standards of living grow. And in fact, the United States has fallen down the chart of um, uh, standard of living, whereas it used to be much, much higher. So, so you're making the case that income inequality, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but are you making the case that income inequality is to some degree, and maybe to a large degree, the result of the uh, uh, failure of labor unions to attract more workers or the fact that there are not more workers that are organized? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah. And there's uh, there's been some interesting studies in the last ten years coming. I the International Monetary Fund and so forth saying that yes, for many decades they were saying inequality was a result of technology and globalization. They're now saying, oh, that was wrong or incomplete. That actually the decline in collective bargaining is a major explanatory factor for the rise in inequality. So, so wait a minute. Twenty seven states have passed right to work laws. Is there any indication, and, and that makes union um, membership far more difficult. Is there any indication that those states and those employers within those states have difficulties attracting competent workers? Are they still able to attract the people they want to attract, even with white right to work laws and no unions? Or essentially nothing. That I think has you know varied. I think in the the recent couple of years, the labor market has really shifted, and they've had a hard time. Turnover is high. People are leaving uh, undesirable or unsafe jobs. So a lot of companies have reported uh, real challenges in retaining their workforce. But you know, a lot depends on the, the cycle of the labor market. And um, one of the things over the last couple of decades is um, companies have been able to find workers because wages are so low. Uh, people are taking second jobs or bringing multiple family members in. We see high school stu students working because they have to contribute to the family income. So we've increased our labor supply by drawing in more hours uh, or more people, but uh, that changed in the pandemic for a variety of reasons, and that has shifted a bit. And yet, and yet, so many people are moving to what we call the sun states, which are largely the right to work states. Um, and it's an interesting dichotomy 
between those workers and, and, the, and the rapid growth of some of those states. Um, you look at some of those states, they're growing quite rapidly, far more rapidly than New York or California, or Connecticut. Um, how do you see uh, AI or technology in general affecting the labor movement? Will this impede the growth of the labor movement? That's a great question. It's a difficult one. Uh, I think there is a way in which, so I guess I can give an example from our uh, industries. So at Amazon, for example, uh, workers in their warehouses are where a, um, a computer on their wrists and this computer directs their labor and it times their motion and their movement and it um, calculates how quickly they're moving the goods they're uh, supposed to move. And this level of surveillance um, uh, gives management a large amount of power over the workers for a couple of reasons. One is, the main reason is that the workers are not privy to how the rate is calculated. So they don't, they're just told you are or you are not working rate. And there's no negotiation over how, what rate is required. So the workers are, uh, live in a relatively um, uninformed, but also uh, scary place in that they don't know whether they're meeting the quotas or not. And so it's easy for management to decide who is and who isn't, and to use that against the workers. So the, the software that's running this process um, definitely contributes to the outsized power of managers versus labor. So it is definitely a concern. That is frightening. Yeah. I find that frightening. Yep. Stephanie, you talked about turnover before. Um, it seems to me that technology, which is obviously growing and has millions of employees now, those in that industry has much more turnover than the steel industry or the auto industry or the coal industry ever had. How does that contribute to um, the success or failure of the labor movement? Do, th do these folks want to be organized? Or do they say to themselves, I'm not going to be in the job that long anyway. I'm going to be here a year or two. I don't need to pay dues and belong to a, a union. Is that uh, a fair assessment? Are you saying in, te in the tech industry particularly? In tech. Well, yeah. and tech as tech spreads. Sure. Yeah. Well, in the tech industry, we've seen indications both ways. We've seen certainly groups of workers who think, you know, they have uh, relatively higher skills and they think they're okay on their own. Um, they don't see themselves as, as needing a union, but we have had a growing number of tech workers be quite interested uh, in unionization and, and an attempt to do so and, and beginning to form um, union organizing efforts. So, uh, you know, there's a, a tremendous variation in that industry. Some are interested in unionization in terms of job security, uh, even if their wages are fine, but their job security uh, and their kind of control over their work lives. And others have actually interestingly um, just felt a moral interest in what their companies are doing and saying like, we're, we're concerned about the future of tech. We wanna have a union to have our voices and to say, you know, input into saying what this company is doing or not doing. And so I've seen that kind of, um, uh, both of those uh, tendencies in that industry. So I just wanna push one more question on that and then I'm gonna turn it over to Gwen. My grandson works at home in the tech industry. He has almost no interaction with any other employee at the firm. There, there's no social relationship. 
I'm wondering if that hinders the union movement. People working alone, they're not working together, they're not friends, they're not having a drink after work. Um, does that lack of social capital affect the ability of you to organize? Yes, no question. I think I think it does. I think that, but it's interesting that uh, a lot more tech companies are moving away from that model. For example, Amazon just is forcing all of its workers to return to the office because of the productivity gains that they see from collaboration and having everybody working together. Um, but the, uh, the ability to divide workers geographically um, certainly does give employers more power and makes it more difficult for unions to develop. So On the other hand, oh, go ahead, Stacey. Go, go ahead, Stephanie. Um, I, I did a study of the Writers Guild. That's a union that has actually seen a growth in membership and among young writers who tend to work at home alone. They actually heavily rely on Twitter to learn about That's unions it. and they rely on um, TikTok and, and Slack and those technologies. To, they've actually built pretty strong solidarity through the technology. Exactly. Yeah, that's well, where I was going to go. My son is in that union, and I'm assuming he's out on the picket line right now. Gwen. Thank you, Larry, Larry and Stephanie and Aaron. Uh, as usual, there are quite a few questions here. Um, one of them, I think, is for Stephanie, and the question is about public sector unions. Uh, and the question as asked are, is, are some of them too powerful and too controlling over public policy? And he refers specifically to teachers unions uh, and unions for graduate students and adjuncts. Yeah. Well, my immediate thought is, I wish they were a lot more powerful <laughs> um, in terms of public policy. I think teachers unions in particular are a front line of defense to keep public schools and public education, which I think is one of the most valuable public assets we have in this country. So um, in that sense, I don't quite see the role of them being too powerful, to be honest with you. I if people do, do critique the teachers unions in particular for saying, do, don't they just protect bad teachers? Aren't they too powerful in terms of keeping teachers who are <clears throat> And, and, and my response is generally like, you know, in society in general, we have an innocent until proven guilty ethos. We've decided as a country that that's the most important approach to take. And that is what teachers unions do is to say, if there are charges against it, a teacher, we're rather than just being able to fire them immediately, we're going to take a process and investigate and really, you know, see what's happening. That's what unions do is change that innocent, you know, in the, in the world without a union, it's guilty unless proven in, or just, it's just guilty if the employer says you're guilty. And this, it puts some stop gaps on that. Yeah. All right, thank you. That's a ringing endorsement of, of teachers and I'm glad to hear it. Hi, uh, Heron, here's a question for you. With your perspective from the United Food and Commercial Workers International Unions, do you feel that unions, and, and we mean this in the broader sense, are developing effective responses to stiff opposition of ma many major US employers? Um, are the responses strong enough so that union membership levels might uh, reverse or recover in the future? Yeah, this is a, that's a huge question. Uh, I think there's um, the tools that employers have to avoid unions uh, are very, uh, are, are widespread and uh, very powerful. So what workers are up against is very, uh, you know, uh, very difficult situation. Um, I think what is happening, however, is that to the extent that, and this is true mostly among uh, younger workers, but not exclusively, but to the extent that they're taking sort of the idea of collective action, collective bargaining um, into their own hands with the support of unions, they're beginning to make real inroads in places like Starbucks and Amazon and Trader Joe's and REI. Um, they're, I think, developing techniques in which they're really building solidarity as an alternative to the individualization that employers try to impose 
on workers. And so to the extent that that workers are able to do that, to build that solidarity, uh, I think they're able to create an alternative vision for what their workplaces should look like. And as they're able to uh, implement that vision, other workers start to see that this is something they want to join. And so they start to um, uh, come along. And if you look at the history of the labor movement, it hasn't grown in sort of a very steady upward trajectory. It's been much more like a J curve, much more quickly in spurts. Okay. And so um, as Stephanie raised at the beginning, are we at one of those turning points? Are we at one of those points where uh, we are gonna see uh, uh, that wave take place? Thank you. Uh, Stephanie, here's a question for you. Uh, you've done extensive research on the wages of home care workers and have supported proposals for fair pay legislation for these workers in New York, New York State. You also showed that the, legisla the legislation as proposed for New York State would generate benefits that are much higher than costs. Uh, can you give us a quick update on where this uh, legislation is in process and kind of a, an outlook for, for what you think will come of it eventually? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, we we the New York State is just one example of where the home care worker uh, shortage is a crisis. People are in really serious trouble about trying to find ways to be at home and, and have the care they need. <clears throat> um, and so we saw that raising wages would uh, result in all kinds of benefits. The legislation last year, the governor um, did raise the wage for home care workers by three dollars an hour. Unfortunately, in this recent budget, she reversed that case. So there is a higher wage for home care workers, but it will actually now be diminishing and going closer to the minimum wage over the next decade. So a lot more needs to be done um, to figure out a way. Home care is a grueling, can be a very difficult job, um, even for workers upstate just to even get to their job, to um, sustain the hours and the scheduling is very difficult, um, sometimes high rates of injury. So um, I think the legislation, will, we'll see it again coming back next year for making real adjustments in that industry to help. Yeah, I just want to add something. And this comes at a time when not-for-profit nursing homes uh, can't possibly exist on Medicaid rates today. Uh, right. And they're going out of business in increasing numbers, which will force more patients to be at home. Uh, and I can't believe a home care worker makes minimum wage rates. That is absurd. Yes. Well, it's just above minimum wage in, in New York State. So there was an increase, but it's you know, we're it's still nowhere near a living wage. How much is a living wage in New York State? Well, it depends on the part of the state. Uh, you know, in, in New York City, some of the estimates show it up to $30 an hour upstate, you know, somewhat less, but um, it depends a lot also on your family size and how many uh, earners. Well, are I'm under. thinking of a family of four. Yeah, yeah. So in New York City, uh, around $30 an hour just to make ends meet. All right, we are coming to the, to the close of the hour and we have time for just one last question. Larry, on the one hand, you, as you have mentioned, firms are responsible to their shareholders and owners. On the other, they need to be fair to their workers, especially those in the lower paid positions. We now see growing inequality of income and wealth. Just to wrap up the discussion, uh, after you've heard what uh, Stephanie and Aaron had to say, what do you see for the future in this regard? I see unions making a better case than, and they're going to have to make a better case for why they should be considered at the bargaining table and why companies are better off having a union in place than not. I don't think the unions have made that case, um, but if they can make that case, bless them. Hey, I think that's the last word on this. Thank you very much, Larry, Stephanie, and Aaron. Uh, our next webinar is Tuesday, June 13th. The topic is baseball. Is baseball on the decline? And if so, how can we save our national pastime? Larry's guest will be Professor Mark Edelman uh, from the, the Zicklin School Department of Law. He is uh, an expert in sports law, so it should be an interesting discussion.
Uh, just to close now, I'd like to thank you, Larry. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Aaron, for a very compelling discussion. Thank you so much. Thanks. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Take care.